Hello, I'm Kevin Kupchinski, planetarium and STEM educator at the Springfield Science Museum. We're going to celebrate Massachusetts STEM Week right now with a look at the night sky. Before we get to the constellations and planets, however, one inspiration to many people who entered STEM spiel was space flights and astronauts. There are astronauts hard at work at the International Space Station right now, and that is something that you can also find in the night sky along with constellations and planets. Let's see how you can do that. Here we are now in a web browser, and we've gone to our search engine and we've put ISS tracking in as the search term, and we get returns for the ISS sighting site from NASA. Let's go ahead and open that up and have a look. And we'll see a map showing locations near you that will have potential sightings of the space station. Now, if the map doesn't come up with your location, it will just be more generalized. So here we are, here's the United States. You can just zoom in to your area and you see the potential sites kind of move around to show you what's going to be close to you and we're going to get this down by Springfield. So we see we've got Mark on Springfield as a potential place and we can go ahead and click that and then click view sighting opportunities. Now of course I've done this before you're going to get to view this so you're going to see dates in your past however you when you do it you'll see dates in your future and the gives you a list of possible dates and times that you could cite the station one thing to look for is this maximum height in degrees. This shows you how high above the horizon the space station will be. And you want to avoid things with smaller numbers like 11. 11 is going to be barely skimming above the horizon. You're not going to see it very well. You want to look for things like 56 or 86. Those will be good ones to look at. And for each of the sightings, it gives you a date and time. It gives you how many minutes the station will be visible for. Where does it first appear? So on this example that I've picked on, it appears 22 degrees above the horizon on toward the northwest. And it will move toward the southeast, and it will disappear about 10 degrees above the horizon. Now. One way to judge the uh, angle above the horizon is to use your fist. If you hold your fist out at arm's length and you pretend that you're resting the bottom of your fist on the actual horizon, not the buildings or trees, the top of your fist will be about 10 degrees above the horizon. So at, when held at arm's length, your fist is about 10 degrees high. And you can use that to judge where you will see that. Let's go back to Stellarium and see what that might look like. Now we're back in Stellarium and we've set it up with the time and date of one of the space station passes we saw listed on the web. Now, if you want to look for a satellite in Stellarium, make sure that the satellite icon is activated and also be sure that the time is set to play so that it will simulate the passage of time going forward. So here we are looking to the northwest and we've been told that the space station should show up somewhere around 1818 it's getting to be about that now so we pay attention up to the northwest and there did you see sort of just pop into view this white dot that's moving this is the space station. And this is what a satellite pass often will look like in the night sky. You'll be looking at the sky and you'll just see this moving dot just kind of show up. One reason is that it's coming out of the shadow of the Earth. And so we can see it all of a sudden. 
In this case, however, it was down in the bright part of the sky, and perhaps it was the sky was just too bright for us to be able to see it. But now, as it gets overhead, we'll adjust our view, and we can see it moving pretty well across the sky. It sort of looks like it could be an airplane, except it's not blinking. It's pretty far up there. We just see one dot, and it does move steadily and fairly quickly across the sky. Now we move over to the southwest, and it's slowly moving over, and it'll start getting lower into the sky. And eventually it will again pass out of you as it either goes into the shadow of the earth or as it goes to a patch of sky that's a little too bright for it to be seen. The space station is one of the few things that you can see while it's still somewhat daylight because of all of the solar panels on it, it reflects a lot of light, and it's actually the brightest thing in the sky after the sun and the moon. So it is visible in a more of a daytime sky. Well, there it goes, and at this time we'll leave the space station and return to a nighttime view where we can look at the stars and constellations. Now we set the time and date to mid-October, about an hour after sunset, just as it's getting dark enough to see stars and constellations. We'll start out with the old standby, the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is low in the northern sky at this time of year. Here's the bowl, and here's the handle. If there is a tree or a building in the wrong place, you may have trouble finding this star pattern. The Big Dipper is always somewhere in the northern sky, however, it will be higher in the northeast during the winter. In the spring, it gets very high in the northern sky, and in the summer, it's over towards the northwest part of the sky. The Big Dipper is not a constellation on its own. It is an asterism, an easily recognizable group of stars. Together with dimmer stars in the area, it forms the constellation Ursa Major, the Great Bear. Once we find the Big Dipper, then people usually wonder about the Little Dipper. In order to find the Little Dipper, we start at the Big Dipper. We go to the two stars on the outside of the bowl. We make a line with them. Follow that line along to the next brightest star that we can find. This is the star Polaris, or the North Star. This star does not change its position during the year because the axis of our Earth's rotation points almost perfectly at this star. It will always be to the north, and in southern New England, it's about halfway up the sky. Polaris is the end of the Little Dipper's handle. Notice how dim the handle is. Here's the bowl. If you have a lot of lights around you, those lights shine up into the sky, bouncing off particles in the air, and that makes it really hard to see what's up there. We call this light pollution. With a lot of light pollution, the central part of the Little Dipper may not be visible at all. The North Star and the two outer stars of the bowl usually can be seen even from a fairly light polluted sky. The Little Dipper is an asterism that's part of the constellation Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. Now we'll shift to the south, and immediately you see two very bright objects over there. These are the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is on the right. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It reflects lots of light back at us, and so it's a fairly bright object in the sky. And on the left of Jupiter, we have the planet Saturn. We'll get back to the planets in a bit. Let's take a look at some of the constellations and stars that you might find. Down below the planets to the right is the constellation Sagittarius. Sagittarius is supposed to be an archer with a bow and arrow. Well, here's the bow and there's the arrow. The rest of them, forget about it. 
When people were making constellations in ancient times, they weren't really trying to make pretty pictures. They were trying to make a system of remembering and understanding the sky so that they could correctly identify the stars, which helped them in planning for the changing of the seasons. Next, we see this bright, fuzzy, cloudy stuff coming from where Sagittarius is. This is the Milky Way. It is light from billions of stars towards the center of our galaxy. Our sun is a star in the Milky Way galaxy, but not near the center. We're pretty far out from the center, and at this time of year, our night sky looks in toward the center. Now, unfortunately, if you have light pollution, or if the moon happens to be out that night, you really can't see this. From a light polluted sky, this area might look more like this. And the Milky Way is not to be seen. Let's go back to a darker sky and enjoy the view and find out what else there is for us to see. Looking up above Sagittarius, going almost overhead up the Milky Way, we see three bright stars. These stars each belong to their own constellation. Collectively, they are known as the Summer Triangle. The constellations are Aquila the Eagle, Lyra the Harp, and Cygnus the Swan. Of these three, only Cygnus bears a resemblance to what it is named. A swan flies with its neck straight out, and if we look here at Cygnus, we see a star at the tail, three stars for the wings, a long neck, and the head way out in front. So it appears that Cygnus is flying along the Milky Way. Now let's shift to the east, and right away we see Mars rising into the sky. Mars is fairly close to us at this time. There are times at a little more than two-year intervals where Mars gets to its closest to the Sun at about the same time the Earth is farthest from the Sun, and so Earth and Mars end up relatively close to each other. At those times, Mars appears fairly bright in our sky. Above Mars, there are four stars making a square. This is the great square of Pegasus, the winged horse. It has some resemblance to a horse. We just have to remember the horse is going to be upside down, and we only see the front part of it. The square makes the horse's body. Then over here, we have the nose and the eye for the head, a neck, the body, and the front legs. In this part of the sky, constellations are not visible all through the year. Constellations appear in the east and seem to move more and more towards the west each week and eventually set in the west. So the constellations away from the northern sky appear seasonally. Pegasus is perhaps the brightest and most easily recognizable of the fall constellations. The rest of the fall constellations are more to the right and underneath of Pegasus. This part of the sky is really dim and without very many recognizable star patterns. Ancient people looked at this part of the sky and they thought of it as the ocean. If you look into a large body of water, such as an ocean, the water is murky and it's hard to distinctly see things. They imagined that's what it was like in this part of the sky. So most of the constellations in this part of the sky have some connection to water. What about Pegasus? Pegasus is the offspring of Poseidon, the god of the oceans. So indeed, Pegasus also has that connection to water and is up above all the water stuff in the sky. So even if the pictures didn't look right, and most of them didn't, they were up there in a pattern or a system that sort of made sense for them to be where they are and it helped people remember and correctly identify the stars. Now let's think about the planets in a little more depth. Planets do something that stars don't. The stars will not change their positions relative to each other. Yes, they seem to come and go with the seasons, but the whole sky moves as a unit and the constellations move with it. So the parent shapes never change because the stars don't appear to move closer or further away from each other. Now stars really are moving, and they are perhaps moving further or away or closer to each other, but they're so far away, we can't see that happen. Planets, however, are different. 
Here we see Mars down below Pegasus, and above to the right of Mars there are two dim stars. Now we'll advance the time. As we do this, you'll notice the whole sky moves a bit towards the west, but you also perhaps notice that the distance between Mars and these two stars is indeed changing. Now Mars is right under the two stars and in between them. Planets are in our solar system orbiting the sun. We are planet Earth also orbiting the sun. As our position changes, as the planet position changes, our line of sight to them is changing, making it appear as if the planets are moving around among the stars. This seems to be a great power, so ancient people made the planets into gods and goddesses in their mythology. Now let's go back to mid-October and look to the south at Jupiter and Saturn. We'll do the same thing. We'll advance week by week, and you see that they don't move nearly as much. That's because they're further away. The further away the planet is, the slower it appears to move in our night sky. However, you might notice some motion, and it looks as though Jupiter is moving over closer to Saturn. Indeed, Jupiter is closer to us than Saturn, so it will appear to move faster than Saturn does. And we're in for a big treat in a couple of months. On December 21st, Jupiter will catch up to Saturn, so to speak, and they'll be right next to each other in the sky, and here they even look as one. This is known as a grand conjunction. It only happens every 20 years. Now, if the 21st is cloudy, the view on the 20th or the 22nd, or even the 19th or the 23rd, will be pretty remarkable, but not quite the same as the 21st. Keep an eye on the Springfield Museum website as we will hope for clear weather and we will have a viewing event of this grand conjunction. As we return to the view of mid-October, this wraps up our look at the night sky. It will look similar to this for the next few weeks. We hope that you get out and enjoy this on your own as soon and as often as you can. Thank you very much.